So I'll okay. give it up to you, Oliver and Celine. Thank you for coming. And for everybody who's listening, enjoy the show. Yeah, um, but quick question, Manu. Um, so questions will be done via the YouTube chat or will you take care of this? I will take care of it. So people can ask the okay. questions in the YouTube chat and I will have a look at the questions and then let you know after the session if there are any questions. Okay, great, good. Then um, I'll take it from you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, yeah providing us the stage and the opportunity to present a really great topic and a, a huge new service um, to you. And uh, we thought uh, we'll start with the introduction, like from a good old James Bond. Uh, the world is not enough, but uh, yeah, today our topic is really Azure Space, and uh, I'm proud to uh, show you that service together with my colleague, Céline uh, Kreyabul, and myself, and we will go with you through this topic today. Um, since the fact that Manu mentioned uh, we are a little bit short on time, or we will end by 6 p.m. CET, uh, we will really focus uh, on that so that you can join afterwards. There are also very, very interesting topic on quantum computing. So, but first of all, a huge thanks to all of you that you have joined in today, because we know there are a lot of other topics and uh, things and Zoom meetings and team meetings and Slack channels and Netflix series. Uh, you could join also in that time. So therefore, massive thank you to you that you joined into our channel this hour. So with that said, what can you expect today? Um, introduction, I think it's already done most of the things. Um, you, you will get a quick overview of Celine and myself. Um, then we'll get, uh, go into the space history. Then you will see a little bit about Azure Space and Azure Orbital. And hopefully afterwards you can uh, differentiate between the two services. You'll see demos of it. Um, and also you will get some ideas of real world use cases we have today with Azure Space and Azure Orbital. And of course, the future outlook. Um, what it will contain, definitely a small portion of marketing, but also on the other hand, a little bit deep tech insights and hopefully a little bit of fun for yourself so that you can enjoy the 50 minutes you're tuned in into the session. So quick on me, Oliver Durr, my name. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I've been now in lovely Switzerland for almost five years and I've been in the IT industry for yeah, nearly 15 years. Um, mostly focusing on the Microsoft stack and um, working in different industries. And yeah, for my personal pleasure in the last time, very much in the space industry um, and supporting their companies and enterprises that would leverage the cloud and the space um, as a new area to grow. So Celine, over to you. Thanks a lot, Oliver, and also a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Celine Kleinbühl. I'm leading the so-called Azure Business Group. That uh, means that I'm responsible for the overall Azure business in Switzerland, the commercialization, how we go about it. Um, what I can call or often jokingly say, I'm already almost a dinosaur at Microsoft. I'm more than 11 years with Microsoft. I was previously in MedTech and I have a business degree in business management. And so I'm very passionate in bridging tech or by the innovation or in technology enabled innovation and how we can commercialize that, the business aspects of it. And for me, Azure Space is just the next area or vertical we are now conquering. And that's why I'm very excited to see all to uh, the new business opportunities unfolding. Okay, thanks, Celine. With that, back to the overview of what you will see today. Uh, starting with Azure Space. That is our new offering we'll provide um, for all companies around the planet. And to give you an idea of what this really is, have a short look on this small marketing insights. I'm not sure we have any sound. There is no sound? There is no sound. Okay. Um, yeah, no worries. I'll paste the link to this because I think that is uh, due to sound sharing over the new YouTube channel. And YouTube in YouTube doesn't look to be working. But nevertheless, um, it, 
uh, we try something new and we know where we can improve for the next time. Um, so with that, let me just go over to the next slide. Um, what, what you should have seen in the video is that uh, there are several uh, use cases for um, space uh, space efforts and um, yeah, also technologies that needs to be enabled um, to leverage the yeah the new market out there uh, that relies on satellite communication as well as on Earth image observation. And on top of that, what we uh, we already see in that industry is uh, that the projected growth in the next uh, 10 years will raise around 30, 300% due to the uh, fact that there will be a lot more satellites uh, orbiting around Earth. And um, why is that the case? Um, because the size and also the cost of uh, satellites has been massively gone down over the years. So for example, compare this huge satellite, it costs around 650 million each piece. Um, and then there are uh, so-called CubeSats. They are only cost, uh, costing 65,000 uh, US dollars per Cube satellite. And there is also something called uh, a chip scale satellite. And you could imagine they are uh, very, very um, cheap. Um, and they can be uh, announced in uh, thousands or 10,000 with only one rocket launch. This is also the next topic. The um, amount of money you'll need for the rocket launch, uh, rocket launch or to get some stuff up into space has tremendously uh, go down from $50,000 uh, per kilogram to currently, so when it started in the 70s around, um, to currently only 2,000 US dollars per kilogram. And it is expected to uh, go even down in the next years, um, given some uh, space launch uh, companies like SpaceX, where you can book a ride share and then uh, your stuff will get pulled up into the air, into space. And on top of that, we know that there are a lot of public companies um, that will launch new satellites for their, um, for example, uh, internet that will or internet access that will spawn across the world. And um, yeah, some of them are SpaceX, uh, OneWeb, or Amazon. And uh, we already know they have announced that the lifetime will be around five to seven years. Uh, I hear some pings and some questions, Manu. Um, something we need to take care of? No, no, we're good. Okay, we're good. Good. So then, with that, if everything's got so cheap, that's your point in time to get your satellite now. So call this number or send an email to this uh, amazing email uh, address and you will get your satellite uh, in a second. So, but is it really the case that everything is so easy and uh, priceless? With that, I would like to hand over to Celine, which will give you a broader picture overview over Azure Space. Thanks a lot, um, Oliver. And I'm not sure whether I want my own satellite flash sales, but interesting and good to know that we can get that also there. When we announced last fall the Azure Space, many questions were arising. And what often we heard from all different market uh, participants or customers, partners in Switzerland is like, are you now, you know, why is Microsoft actually entering the space level and uh, the business? And what is often and where we are starting here and what we would like to share and explain is also for the Azure and Microsoft, it is another element where we would really democratize the access to it. And it is how we're going to design this business is all about how can we bring up the Microsoft innovation, the Azure innovation, the same principle as it applies as we know now, and enter partnerships where we can really democratizing the access for the users, the developers, and the operators to take advantage of this new market segment. We don't have any intention to enter or to launch our own rockets, to enter that space, to send people to the moon, to the to Mars or whatever. It's really how can we all bring together and bring provide really the computing platform to make it real. Um, or how it is said, it's bring all the innovation to the space community. And what it's all about, it is providing and creating a new 
partnership or an ecosystem based on partnership for to provide advanced and secure resilient capabilities and it's actually based on four pillars it's about how can we make sure everybody has access to global connectivity how can we connect everybody's data from anywhere in the world at any security level into our cloud platform ultimately or but also other cloud platforms if needed how can we bring ai to the space that we can turn data into knowledge and insights how can we actually empower or generate enable the next in level of engineering um and how can we ultimately actually create really our worldview has been for a long long time about you know the intelligent cloud and but especially also intelligent edge how can we connect every device everywhere on the world but it's not just in the world it's also in space now but we can really ultimately connect the edge on and off the planet really to go about it and how what are the elements to make it happen and when we announced last year with azure space um, there was a big announcement which really connected to it. It was about the Azure Modular Data Center. And as we have seen much more uptake by that one, which is complementing our levels. And how it's designed, and Oliver will share you much more in detail how it's technically and looking about it, is really use everything you know, all our different data center regions with the Azure Orbital Ground Stations, which we announced, partner ground stations we are going to integrate in the network as well and our newly announced or la in newly last fall announced azure modular data centers connecting different earth observation satellites satcom satellites low or medium earth orbit satellite orbiters that and bring it all together and the next one and i, I think Oli, you would like to highlight the azure modular data center let's see whether that works Yes, but I think you can't hear the audio from this video as well, right? No, we can't. Okay, so we have to skip this also. But uh, th there are good visuals and it's only five seconds. So stay with us and look what your eyes can see. So in the end, what you've seen, um, it really described the network failure happens on Earth with a physical cable, and then the um, markets of the data center can uh, switch over with a high, uh, high available network uh, module to connect to the other satellites um, where we have partnered up to still be connected to the cloud and also to the customers and serve your workloads you present to your customers. Mm -hmm. Oli? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, speaking of the modular data center, um, this is the idea uh, behind where, what the video just showed you. Uh, you will have the network high availability module so that at every point in time you will be able uh, to reach the cloud and also reach your customers. And uh, this will happen on a huge partnership uh, combined with one of the most experienced uh, satellite providers and also ground station providers on Earth. So, for example, KSAT, Vegasat, or Kratos. And uh, the idea behind this is that we also leverage and extend our partnerships with them so that we will even um, provide more uh, connecting places uh, around the globe. And you can see here a small map where we already uh, up and running with the services, and you will also or you will also get an uh, idea how our own ground station can look like. So, to have, uh, give you an idea what kind of use cases there are, Celine will give you some insights. Perfect. Thanks a lot to go about it. So. Uh, I really like this slide summarizing what how it is how artificial intelligence for geospatial intelligence is going out. What is it taking? It's taking from a source level all the different elements. Um, how or it starts with high quality Earth imagery. And what has been also very new for me is how big the demand is for and the use cases simply by taking high quality Earth demand or Earth imagery. Um, and how that can be taken and how we take it then, label it, extract the metadata, 
train models on it and actually deploy it, especially also in edge scenarios. And I would like to also, in the interest of time, and I know we are already running behind, only call one out, and that is Azure Farm Beats, because we see it highly applied already in Switzerland. Switzerland is actually one of the pilot countries for Farm Beats for a high, you know, innovative agricultural area or new agriculture areas and why is it so important or why is Switzerland one of the countries because most of how the Swiss um, agricultural fields are composed are actually very good representation of the world agricultural um, industry all up from a different perspective on different uh, grains or you know different products which are harvested and seeded harvested and produced and it's very interesting to see how we are working with leveraging earth imagery to observe the fields to see what is needed how they are all developed and how the fields need to be um how do you say it in english i'm losing my words um how they bestellt how the felder need need to be bestellt and why is another reason why Switzerland is actually one of the pilot markets in that area is because in Switzerland and the sensors are staying in the grounds and they are not um, actually unpacked and sold for different purposes. And that's why in Switzerland there are multiple projects ongoing for the future of agricultural in collaboration with Fart Speeds and Space Eye. Okay, thank you. So now you have gotten um, a first overview of what's possible with the Azure space. And uh, now we'll get a little bit deeper into Azure Orbital, which is part of Azure of our Azure space program and our Azure space offering. And Azure Orbital really is the ground station as a service. So why do we think that a ground station as a service can be the next big thing? Because uh, building your own ground station as a service in your backyard uh, in Zurich downtown city or in the Argo or uh, in Geneva might be a little bit expensive, uh, even uh, if there uh, is some land available. Uh, it's also expensive and uh, complex to operate and maintain it. Um, and also, yeah, the perfect uh, selling point for a cloud uh, resource is scalability. If you have it in your own backyard, you can only use it. But will you really leverage it 24-7? We highly doubt that you would like to do this. And therefore, we have uh, central ground stations that can be leveraged by uh, customers and people across the world. And that will uh, get a better scalability and a definitely better uh, return on invest ratio from a cost perspective. So because also here, you only pay what you use. Uh, for a ground station, which is normally very, very pricey. So um, to differentiate the use cases we have with Azure Orbital, um, first of all, there is the Earth observation and global communications. What is that in detail? So Earth observation, for example, um, you could uh, schedule a definitely, uh, um, uh, you can schedule um, the contact to your Earth imagery collecting satellite yourself using our ground stations, or you could um, use the images we provide in the open data set catalog. Um, and they I heard an issue, so therefore I was stopping. Um, or you could leverage the images we provide with the satellite uh, and the satellite partners, um, and we provide the images in Azure. And besides the Earth observation, we have the global communications thing. So you all know VPN connections, extra route connections to Azure. And with this, uh, you can extend this connectivity topic um, around the globe uh, yeah, to very uh, rural areas or uh, areas where you might don't have uh, such good internet connection. But of course, you can have a satellite uplink and uh, therefore you could also leverage this service. Um, to give it you in, in a whole overview, what the idea is behind that um, is that with Azure Orbital, you get a managed service for a very, very complex topic and a complex physical uh, setup because um, not like a switch or a virtual machine, an Azure, Azure Orbital ground station is a really heavy thing. So just to give you an idea what this is and what you will get as a managed service with just the click of a button, 
here are some pictures uh, from our uh, from one of our antennas we have set up in the Quincy Data Center in the Washington State. So I guess this is nothing you would like to have in your backyard and also operate it. And also Stromberger Zurich or uh, BKW will uh, get, give you a very, very huge uh, electricity bill by the end of the month. So uh, to give you an idea where you can leverage on uh, Earth these uh, Microsoft uh, data center uh, connected ground stations, this is the map of the uh, locations where we currently will support the ground station uh, service. And uh, the ones, uh, one of the ground stations you've already seen uh, is in the US, West Quincy. Um, but in the end, you will see all major parts of the world are supported with ground stations uh, by Microsoft. And uh, to have it even more um, and yeah, distribute the workload also, uh, we are, for example, partnered up with KSAT, and uh, their ground stations are also connected to the Microsoft data centers, uh, and you can leverage these uh, ground stations also to connect to your uh, satellite or um, yeah, to set up the connectivity. So, um, for uh, but how does could Earth observation look like in a real technical example? Um, this is an architectural overview from an end-to-end -end com communication, how it will work from the satellite over the ground station as a service, and then our um, virtualized um, uh, command and control uh, module. And then this is connected with a private uh, connectivity into the customer's virtual network, so into your subscription or into your um, Azure AD tenant where your workloads will happen. Um, and there the software radio modem is also installed. Uh, you will, can encrypt the data and then you can do whatever you like with the data. You can use uh, high performance compute to analyze images. Um, you can push the data into your data lake or and store it for historical reasons. Um, there are endless opportunities you could do. Um, and you could leverage the, all the, the well-known resources uh, of the Azure Cloud to do high-performance computing. So we also partner up with uh, uh, third-party vendors. In that case, for uh, example, Earthycast or Tails Alenia. And Earthycast is therefore, uh, uh, or you can leverage them, their solution to convert the raw satellite data into ultra high analytics uh, uh, images that are already uh, usable for machine learning data. This normally uh, takes uh, several hours when not days if you do it on your own. And with Earthycast, you have the Earth pipeline where you can do this really um, in a matter of minutes. And on top of that, there's the solution from Tails Alenia. They then can interpret the images and for example, compare images, um, what have changed over the uh, over a specific amount of time, so that it is more easier, for example, construction workers or uh, city planner, planners to see where the city really has developed. And how this can look like is uh, such kind of image. You see the yellow dots in here. This is um, highlighted by the artificial intelligence from Thales, um, where the, the artificial intelligence module has detected change over time from the satellite images that have been uh, provided. In that case, uh, the satellite images came from Deimos too. So how does this look like from a technical perspective? Um, you can see the classical Azure resources are behind the scenes um, working. So you have an event grid, you have Azure functions, you have, of course, Kubernetes and containers and Kida. So the Kubernetes event-driven autoscaler. So all the good stuff and modern stuff is in there. You can leverage it behind the scenes to process the satellite images. And also, for, for those of you who are, who are interested in the cost perspective, you really can see how the scaling works um, and uh, yeah, how the Kubernetes cluster that is uh, sitting behind the scenes is uh, scaled up and scaled down only for the amount of time where the processing really happens. So then when you reflect it back from a cost perspective, 
um, it's the best you can get. So, um, but what's for the general development? Um, how can you test this um, if you don't have the ground station uh, now uh, uh, accessible directly? For this kind of thing, we have the Azure Orbital Emulator. And this is a, uh, um, yeah, a set of different tools where you can test and validate um, your orbital or your, your um, imaging, imagery tests and validations. And um, yeah, you then don't have to do it uh, in Azure yourself. You can therefore leverage this tool um, and check if everything works as expected. So to uh, give you the overview and then wrap it up, how it integrates the Azure Orbital, the ground station as a service into the whole Azure ecosystem, it really is the extension of the data center to the satellites um, where you can uh, enhance your connectivity or add connectivity to places where you normally wouldn't have connectivity or access to the cloud. So with that, Normally, my colleague Mark Rosinovich uh, wanted to present a small demo for us, but unfortunately, uh, that the audio does not work. We have to skip this demo because uh, looking only the um, looking only the video without tone is not that interesting. Maybe okay. you can highlight a few words on. Yes, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so, but no worries. We have prepared something, uh, what we already wanted to show you. Um, mm -hmm. In the end, what you would have seen in the video is that uh, Mark will be able to connect from an iPhone over a satellite connectivity into an Azure resource. And uh, you will see here the whole uh, uh, flow of the data. Um, he has an iPhone that is connected to a satellite uplink. And sorry, I, I have to go back to the video because you have to see this. Um, because Celine and myself weren't able to give to get this on time in our home offices to present it to you. Um, so I'll do it in the video. Yeah. yeah, there you can see it. Uh, this lovely device is a direct satellite uplink. Um, of course, it's uh, very, very cheap. You can get it uh, at Digitech or uh, Interdiscount uh, or your uh, uh, electronic um, um, sales of your choice. Uh, but we weren't able to get it, therefore Mark has uh, a device like this. And with that, uh, it is possible to spin up a so-called 5G campus network. And to this, an iPhone can connect. So 5G campus uh, network, for those who don't know this, um, it's something like you are your own telecom provider and set up your own telecom network. So your own Swisscom uh, network for your mobile phone. And this satellite uplink device is then automatically connected to an Azure Orbital uh, satellite, uh, provides the uplink and the downlink. The ground station as a service provides you, oh, I see something in the chat. Ah, okay, on the YouTube, okay. Um, the, set, the, um, the satellite uplink then goes to the ground station as a service connects to the Azure data center and there over the private endpoint connects to a storage account and shows the index.html, which then is shown on the iPhone over the satellite connection. That was what is shown on the video, which unfortunately you couldn't see. Um, but in the end, you can see what kind of use cases are there. Um, so with that, the uh, integration of the, the 5G campus network you then really can see what kind of opportunities and new use cases you might have in the future for satellite connectivity. 
Um, also, given the fact that we don't have audio, we have to skip this video as well. But the first few seconds you can see because um, it's important to, to give it, uh, get at least an understanding what a huge partner of us called ClearSpace is doing. And I, I try to synchronize it um, yeah, um, in, in real time. So, oh no, they, it has subtitles, so you can also read it. So um, what you've just seen is uh, the use case from our partner ClearSpace, and they are trying to build um, a satellite that is something like a garbage collector for space, um, because there is a lot of space debris uh, that has started since humanity has entered space, and uh, they would like to collect this debris and remove it from space so that in future, we, uh, uh, we all have the opportunity and all the, the enterprises out there have the opportunity to leverage the space in space. Because if there is too much debris, uh, you will definitely need someone like, you know, from a great Disney movie, someone who cleans up there and clear space will do that. Um, and why is that required? You may remember the slide we have seen earlier in the session um, from SpaceX and OneWeb and so on, and the amount of satellites they will launch. And uh, maybe you remember uh, back from uh, your university times or school times, probability calculation, and uh, given the fact that uh, 57,000 satellites will be uh, shoot up into space, the probability is definitely there that some of these satellites won't function correctly anymore, and then uh, maybe collide with other satellites uh, up in space. And that could uh, cause a huge, huge problem um, for communication, for uh, the satellite imagery use cases, um, and in general, maybe led to the situation that no rocket will ever be able to leave uh, planet Earth in the long-term future. So what else? Uh, can you do with Azure Space and Azure Orbital? And for further use cases, I would like to hand over to Celine to give you an insight on what's possible already today. Thanks a lot, Oliver. And I think ClearSpace is a great example who a Swiss startup out of actually APFL, who is really de redefining sustainability beyond Earth and our planet. But the most advanced use cases we currently see is actually all around sustainability, leveraging um, our Earth, uh, our space offering. One the big one is around the CO2 offset, especially on for forests and reforesting. It is one of the big issues apparently, and I wasn't aware of it until very recently, is that the trade of the certificates to really offset CO2 is, are we really, is that, um, is that forest which is reforested, which is you know updated, is that only sold once, or are multiple vendors who are offsetting such climate certificate issuing it twice and having an overview on how that's done and keeping track on how it's growing, whether it's reforested, is one of the big uh, elements and one of the big use cases we key see currently adopted. Another one is cattle count 2.0. Two weeks ago, there was a big pan-European hackathon uh, for leveraging AI to combat climate, the climate crisis we see. And the Swiss team actually was one of the winners of the pan-European hackathon, and they came up with a project where they were counting cattle, and not only counting cattle, but actually uh, analyzing their mesen uh, output 
to actually refactor it. What is the fact or what is the impact on the climate by the cattle being out there in the different fields and different uh, circumstances and the different situations. Very inspiring projects, very nice use cases, also very interesting, you know, predictions on how uh, the cattle fields are maintained, how they're fed, how it's everything is there and that what is the issue and what needs to be offset with simply based on the mess and output. Another big use case is actually, and I don't know whether you've seen it, but it's from this February, where we have been uh, collaborating with HPE to connecting our the ESS. Um, and what is very interesting is the use cases, where or what is all about it. It's about using uh, or providing better model data of, uh, uh, you know, modeling the dust storms, which is um, could enable future modeling for Mars missions to really understand bit how are the dust storms affecting the weather models and the weather, you know, the dust storms to really plan such journey. One is very interesting is also on plant and hydroponics analysis to support food growth and life science in space to really analyze that in detail. But I think the most very tangible one, or for me, the most tangible one is really to improve the medical or empower medical imaging using ultrasound on the ISS to support the healthcare and uh, observe the healthcare of the astronauts on the ISS. If you haven't seen it yet, I really recommend you to have a look at the Azure blog out there or mentioned here in the slides. One last one. Yes, thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, just to come into the details um, of the, the yeah, for, for the IT pros uh, in the audience, uh, what has been launched uh, to the ISS, um, there is a, a classical uh, um, uh, Hewlett Packard uh, enterprise uh, computer on it. And uh, a very interesting thing where we don't think uh, here on earth is that they had to plan the contact time very, very wisely and also the amount of data they will send down uh, back, uh, they, they will send it back to earth. Um, maybe some of you are uh, a very long time in the IT industry and uh, remember the time where you have to uh, very precisely plan your uh, calculation time and CPU time on a mainframe. And um, it's something uh, or uh, literally the same today with the amount of data you would like to send from a uh, satellite or a space uh, craft uh, to Earth because you only have very short amount of contact windows and therefore you also have a very small amount of data currently that you can uh, transfer. So uh, in our case, it was two megabytes per second for two hours per week. So this is not a huge time window, also not a very huge amount uh, of data you could transfer. So therefore you need to be very careful in your planning what you would like to send over. Um, and that enables uh, another part or an, an another a pillar of our thinking that computing needs also to be enabled at the edge. Because in the ISS itself on the HPE device, there is already a, a compression of the data and also a selection of the data on a very, very high intense uh, uh, compute uh, engine so that you really send only the data down that is valuable and uh, that is worth to be sent it down on Earth to be calculated there for further use cases. Okay, so we also have the planetary computer and uh, Celine, please go, ahead. go no, further go. with it. No, please go ahead, sorry. Oh, okay, good, no worries. Um, the planetary computer uh, data is uh, a thing we uh, would like to, yeah, where, what we provide and where we would like to enable others uh, to build on this platform and this platform data to create new business, new business models um, and new use cases. So maybe the people who are familiar with space know that uh, these are very important uh, Earth imaging uh, satellites that um, uh, going around the yeah going around our Earth and provide very high detailed um, images from uh, different areas across the world. And with the planetary computer data uh, and the data API, 
you can collect this data and you could, for example, shape a request and say, okay, I would like to have uh, the data of Manhattan City um, for the streets. Uh, you need to provide the coordinates, give it to the API, and you then will get the uh, high resolution imagery back from it. Um, and normally you have to wait if you are uh, used to Google Maps, for example, one year or two years if the data is actualized. And with this amount of data and also the very short interval of updates and of the images the satellites deliver, you can really, really shorten this time window uh, to just a few weeks or maybe sometimes a few days where you can detect um, deltas or changes in the imagery. Also in the planetary computer data, there will be uh, weather and climate data provided from satellites uh, which are flying around the world and uh, which are leveraged uh, for free. And also they can be consumed by using the planetary computer data API. Um, all this uh, is provided in our open data set. Uh, and you can look it up uh, under this URL and maybe find a use case for yourself where you can leverage these open data sets um, and maybe build your next business out of it. And just to give you some food for thought, what could happen in not the near future, but in, in the future, maybe in 10 or 20 years from now? Given the experience we will collect with uh, the modular data center in very rural areas, we might well have the opportunity to support uh, space agencies to set up a data center on moon. And then you will maybe have an Azure region that is called Moon 1, Moon 2, and Moon on the dark side. So that you can even uh, extend your business beyond Earth, just to give you an idea what maybe could be possible. Also, if you're interested in that topic, um, there is um, an, a consortium called Mars, Mars Moon Astronautics Academic and Research Science, a uh, very, very interesting in institution. Um, you can sign up there, learn a lot more about space, and you can also have the opportunity to train for so-called ana uh, analog astronauts in a desert or somewhere else. And in the end, they try to find uh, plans how they can, uh, how humans can live on Mars uh, as the end goal. Um, and since you don't, uh, that is our goal, that you not only see that Microsoft is working in the space space, um, we have provided you this public available uh, yeah, landscape over the space area. So you can see there is def definitely a lot going on in that area, already a lot of new companies, um, which are not in the Fortune 500 yet, but maybe in the Fortune 500 of 2030. Um, so it's definitely a very interesting industry that is just about to race. With that, Celine and myself would really, really thank you that you have tuned in to the session for now. And yeah, we are ready for some questions if you have one. And thanks again. <laughs>